Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome you to today's uh, Voxel Max webinar uh, focused on uh, 4D models and the transportation sector. Uh, we have uh, with us today Peter Atala, our CEO, who's going to uh, be a part of the presentation with myself, Brian Soliday. We want to welcome you. A um, couple of things. If you have a question for us, please uh, provide that um, the question via the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, so you'll see that. And then uh, just an FYI, we are recording this session and we'll be providing this to everyone after the event. And we ask that you please feel free to pass that along to your colleagues uh, that couldn't make it today. So with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to be presenting. So we're gonna to start today with just an overview of voxel maps. And uh, Peter's gonna share with us the whole concept of maps for machines and then get into talking about volumetric mapping and what that really means to us within the voxel world. Uh, speak a little bit of time talking about data collection and how we do data collection uh, for, uh, for our projects. And then uh, I was gonna talk a bit about our uh, initiative called the 100 Cities Project that we, that we just recently kicked off. Uh, then talk about uh, some of the right-of-way uh, and transportation use cases and some of the capabilities and, and, uh, and areas where the technology is being used across a number of industries. Um, I'm then gonna just share with you some of the highlights that we pulled from the uh, US Senate infrastructure bill. And so um, we're gonna be providing you with some more detailed information about that in terms of a white paper, um, given that the bill itself is very, very geospatial and very infrastructure oriented. Everyone on this call should be very interested in that. And then we'll close it out with a number of questions. So with that, what I'd like to do is hand it over to uh, Peter Atala. Uh, Peter's the CEO of Voxel Maps. Go ahead, Peter. Thanks, Brian, really appreciate that. Um, good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to join us today. And, and you know, we, we were hoping to share a little bit about Voxel Maps and what we do and kind of the applications of the technology. So let's get started then. Um, just to, by way of giving a little bit of background on the company, um, Voxel's been going for about four and a half years. But actually, it was a spin out from an existing um, mapping company called Navme. Uh, Navi was uh, based actually in, in the UK, uh, but actually became quite a big mapping company. We mapped 180 countries around the world, which is almost the whole planet. Um, it was a huge project, took about 10 years, collecting about 7 billion kilometers of data and involving tens of thousands of people. Uh, but we had a division of that business that was really focused on what should the future of mapping be like? And so we decided to separate that out and that became Voxel Maps um, and we've been kind of separated since. Uh, in terms of our location, the headquarters is in San Francisco, but we have a number of offices around the world, um, Mexico City for Latin America, the UK and Portugal covering uh, Europe, and then we have Singapore and uh, Sydney, Australia as well. So we're about 350 people or so, uh, growing pretty, pretty quickly at the moment. Now, Brian mentioned in the introduction the concept of maps for machines. And so I wanna take a few moments just to kind of explain what we mean by that. So human maps, I'm sure we're all very familiar with. These are the maps that are in our mobiles, on our uh, well, phones and cars and computers, web, et cetera. And they're mainly around a use case of navigating people to an address, be that a street or a building or a city. The secondary use case is really around visualization. So it's, you know, taking some form of geodata and putting additional layers on top of, uh, on top of maps. The majority of human map data is 2D. There are some 3D elements, but it's not extensive yet. And it's pretty low resolution stuff. So we're talking one to three meters in terms of accuracy. And, and that's fine for humans because we can decide where we want to walk, where we want to drive. But when we start looking at machines, the requirements are very different. So really a machine level map is a true spatial 3D model uh, of everything that we see in a given environment. So in cities, we're analyzing many different types of objects. That's everything from clearly the buildings, the, the roads themselves, but infrastructure, telecoms, utilities. Um, in non-urban environments, that can be vegetation, land structures, land classification. And we're doing this at very high resolutions. So we're talking one to four centimeters in terms of resolution. So imagine just you know, creating a map to that kind of resolution. There's a lot of possibilities. So with this kind of map and model, we're not just looking at the location of objects, but also different uh, features of them, the measurements, the attributes of the, uh, the, the objects that we're looking at. 
And then when we talk about machines, it's everything from computer models and artificial intelligence to better understand cities or different types of environment, all the way through to new forms of autonomy, be that autonomous vehicles, delivery robots, AMRs, which are automated miniature robots, even drones as well. And there's a requirement for this, this data and this model to exist everywhere. So outdoors is definitely one of the biggest use cases, but there's a requirement for indoor data, for subterranean data, even in the future, ocean data as well. And there's some interesting stuff around that. So I wanna start really by explaining then the approach to how we build these, these maps. And really it's around this concept of volumetric mapping. So I wanna sort of compare and contrast standard 3D and then a volumetric approach and just explain the difference. So this is an example of a 3D map. This is from Google, but there's other alternatives here. Apple, for example, um, have these maps. And these are great visualization tools for humans. They, they look very pretty, they look like the city, um, but in reality, these are very low resolution structures. So when we zoom into the structures, we start to see a very basic mesh object with some kind of texture over the top. Again, for visualization, it's absolutely fine. But if we were to perform measurements and calculations from it, it's, it's too low resolution, but, you know, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't suffice. The additional problem with this kind of technology in terms of meshes is that there's no interior information uh, to the mesh. And so you know, if we went inside there, there wouldn't be anything else there. And so that's really because meshes are focused on one aspect of physical matter, which is the surface information. But in reality, the interior information when it comes to mapping is very important as well. One example of this is for if you're looking at the brain, if you're scanning and mapping the brain, you don't do that in meshes. You do that using a volumetric approach because the interior information is incredibly important. So that's what we do really at Voxel Maps. We build a volumetric model uh, of the planet. And so the way that we do this is using voxels, which I'll come and explain what those are. But essentially using this approach, it allows us not only to map the, the surfaces of everything that we see, but also the interior information as well. And that's very, um, that's very powerful when it comes to updating the maps and making sure that we have a model whereby we can collect data and automatically have the data drop into the model without having to do a lot of pre-processing uh, involving humans to, uh, to make that happen. We also add a fourth dimension of time. And this becomes very powerful for change detection. And I'll show you some examples of that as we go through the presentation. So how do we do this? The, the approach that we take is using voxels. And voxels are just 3D pixels. They're essentially, they're cubes. This isn't necessarily a new technology uh, in terms of voxels themselves. They've been used in things like computer games for a long time. So Minecraft is an example of a voxel rendered world. Um, and as I mentioned, they're also used in things like brain scans. But actually what we do is we use an approach that first was developed in robotics. And it's using voxels in a configuration called a VOG or a voxel occupancy grid. The use case here would be that there'd normally be a small robot with some kind of 3D sensor on the top, maybe a LiDAR, and it would go into a room and it would produce a very basic 3D matrix, essentially, of the room so it could navigate its way around. So we took this idea, but we applied it to the, the entire planet. The technology is something called an MRVOG, a multi-resolutional voxel occupancy grid. So we took the Earth and we placed a mega voxel, a giant voxel over the entire planet. And then this voxel is full of multi-resolutional voxels. Uh, theoretically, they can be any size, but for our purposes, we use eight meter voxels down to one centimeter voxel. Now this matrix of voxels goes straight through the earth. It's what we call an earth-centered, earth-fixed reference frame. Um, and because it's everywhere, everywhere you're sat at the moment is full of these, these uh, virtual voxels. Each voxel has a permanent position in space and has a unique address, a machine address. But to start with, it's, it's blank. It's just a reference system. There's no information in it. So what we need to do is we validate the occupancy status of the voxel. Basically, is the voxel in free space or is it in matter? So we do this using LIDAR. If the laser beam from the LIDAR passes through the voxel and it's not reflected off anything, we say this is free space. But the moment that it's reflected off a surface, we label this as occupied. And so what we're doing really is etching out the matter of the planet in this way. But the fact that this is a global structure that we have here, really what, what's been created is this global spatial database for 3D and 4D data. It's real time, it's persistent, so it's always on, it's always there. 
Um, and it's designed to handle planetary scale, so thousands and thousands of petabytes of data. It's also integrated directly as well with 5G. So as that becomes enabled in the future, you have the ability to do real-time updates to the model as well. Now, there's some other really interesting benefits for using this approach in comparison to using points in 3D or meshes in 3D. So firstly, each voxel is a volumetric measurement unit. So it's very easy to perform calculations within the space. Secondly, on the surface of the voxels, we can put layers of additional information. So typically this can be from cameras, uh, things like RGB values, for example. It could be hyperspectral imagery. It could even be radar. So with the voxels, we have the shape of things. With the surface information, we have an aspect of color. And then we can apply artificial intelligence in terms of deep learning models to look at these collections of voxels and recognize what they are in 3D. It's a true 3D semantic segmentation, not just a 2D pixel led semantic segmentation. So the performance of recognition is much, much higher and has the ability then to recognize features and automatically extract those features. Now, it can do this in 3D, but it can also do it in 4D. So every voxel has an infinite number of time states. So it has a temporal data component. So we can get the AI not just to look at what's currently there, but also look at past data and compare the two. So we can do change detection, uh, which becomes a really powerful uh, tool. And so when you combine this with the, the permanent addressing, the, the global spatial database, the ability to intelligently search and pull back information, it becomes an incredibly powerful uh, platform, kind of a superior platform really for building digital twins and digital twin technology. So I have a video here that I'd like to, to show you, and this just shows the real data. So actually collecting data, this is from San Francisco. Uh, we'll start with just the occupancy data alone. So these are all voxels, this occupancy. And then we layer on the camera data. So we get this aspect of color. And once we have that, we get the AI to start doing the recognition. So all these pretty colors you see here, these are automated recognition events, which then can be vectorized by the data, by the artificial intelligence. At this point, we have the ability to play around with the data. We can export any set of features into any format um, or you know, explore things in, in different ways. And currently the system is trained to recognize about 100 different assets in cities. We'll be up to about 200 assets um, pretty soon in the next couple of months. And we have the ability to train it on, um, you know, if we have a customer that has a new type of asset, then it's a pretty simple process for us to go through and train the networks to, to recognize that feature. And then they can, it can run across the whole of the data set and pull back that, that information. We're also doing this indoors as well. So it's not just an outdoor use case. We're actually training up the networks as well to recognize common features in indoor settings. So that brings me on really to this platform, this insight platform. So all of the, uh, what you just saw when the AI recognized the features and vectorized the data, that's powered by what we call the Voxel Insight platform. So this, what you can see here is essentially screenshots from the platform. And you can see the different colored lines and colored boxes. Each one of these is a recognition event. So it's recognizing an object automatically, but it's also performing the calculation. So from this interface, it's possible to export out into any other format. So you can export into formats or applications that you're used to using, uh, but obviously we collect, process, and store in voxels, which is a much better, more efficient way of doing that. From this interface as well, you have the ability to explore the data. So you can do virtual surveys. You can perform calculations within the space. You can even put a virtual reality headset on and walk around uh, the data in the cities as well, should you wish to. We have a number of other um, tools which make the, 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 the whole process and the data very accessible. So there's online web versions, so you can access the data via the web. We also have the ability to provide you guys the, the training set, so you can actually train the AI to recognize different features. Now we can do that entirely for you, but some, some customers also like to do it themselves. So this is just an example. This is actually a web-based solution. And you can go into the data and you can start training. This is a process called annotation. Here, the, the person is annotating trees. And so you, you train the networks to recognize the features you want. And once it's trained to a sufficient level, then the networks can run across all of the data 
and extract those features that, that you're looking for as well. So that's really the underlying technology. That's the, the data model, the, the advanced artificial intelligence to power the, uh, the insights. But let's talk a little bit about the data collection side. So the way that we collect data is by using a, a sensor that we developed called Simbo. And these sensors have really been designed to do large scale mapping projects. So one of the key things was about mobility and logistics. So this sensor can be installed by one person. It takes them about 10 minutes to do the initial install. And thereafter about five minutes to, to put on and to take off. Um, at the end of a, a mapping day, you can take it and put it back in a Pelican case, store it in a hotel room. It doesn't need to be permanently affixed uh, to, to the car. It also doesn't need to have a computer in the back of the car. Uh, in this platform, it has full edge processing. So it's running very powerful graphic cards inside, which process all of the data. So the platform consists of LiDAR, cameras, high accuracy GPS and IMU, the ability to use RTK and PPK for corrections, and also 5G signal uh, as well, if we want to offload the data. You have the ability to offload either using hard drives or using 5G if 5G is uh, available, or, or even Wi-Fi. So we have two ways that we approach working with customers. One, we can do projects end-to-end, -end, so we can provide uh, our vehicles, our sensors, people, and we map the particular areas uh, for the customers. Or some customers like to have their own uh, system, and in which case we provide the technology to them and then do the processing and obviously support through the, the process. We also have a new version of uh, the Simbo, which is due to be released in September, the end of September. This is using dual LiDAR. Um, this is particularly useful for taller buildings. You have the ability to angle the LiDARs and scan much higher uh, up uh, structures as well. The rest of the platform is, is pretty similar to, uh, to the existing one. So it's, um, it's very useful. In terms of the operational use as well, it's not just about providing your hardware and, uh, and going, uh, going away. We have a bunch of tools which make it easy to perform mapping missions. So the starting point is a mapping mission planner. It's an online uh, application where we can take data for a city or even an entire country and break it down into daily mapping missions for operators. And then those mapping missions can be assigned automatically to the different operators. On their iPad, they see the, the jobs that they have to do for that particular day. And it can even direct them as well, kind of increase the efficiency of doing that, that mapping project and the mapping collection. What they see when they're, they're logging in, once they've accepted a, a mapping job, is a very easy to use interface. You see a map which keeps track of where you've been and kind of leaves that trail uh, on the map. You see the status of the device. So if everything is green, it's all working very well. If something's red, then it allows you to troubleshoot. We even have the ability to remotely connect to the devices as the devices are online um, and, and troubleshoot if there's, there's issues. One of the other really nice features here is it gives you real-time feedback in the mapping process. As you see the trail when you're mapping, if it's green, it means everything was working well. If, if it goes uh, amber or red, then there's problems with the data. And it's better to alert the operator there and then so they can redrive that area versus um, discovering that in post-processing weeks later and then having to go back you know, out and collect the data again. So it's really designed to, to make it very easy to use uh, for people to, uh, to collect very high resolution mapping data. So some of the benefits, you know, you know, why do this? Well, firstly, it allows you to map much faster than the majority of traditional approaches as well, and take some of the headache out of existing mobile mapping solutions if people are using them, which can be very cumbersome, expensive, difficult to deploy, a lot of calibration and setup, all of that has kind of been removed. When you're building then data into this digital, so when you're mapping everything, even if you're only just interested in one asset, you're actually collecting the data for everything. So you have the flexibility to pull out additional features at a later time that doesn't need to be another mapping mission. You, you have all of the data fundamentally there, so you can pull those assets out. And by doing this, by creating a platform that's easy to use with one person operating it, it reduces cost. It's very easy to deploy, um, very easy to scale up and do large scale country uh, wide collections uh, using something. Uh, like this. And as I said, mapping everything is, is kind of a key part of what we do at Voxel and building out these digital twins. 
The, the last thing I want to talk about today before handing over to, to Brian, who will talk about some of the use cases of this technology, is to let you know about a project that we're working on at the moment, which will be available soon. So this is what we call the 100 cities model, and it's a data as a service model. So this is where we're going actively and mapping 100 cities, the top, the top kind of US metro areas um, around the country. And that data will be available around Q2 next year. Um, and instantly can, you can use it off the shelf, you can access it online, uh, use it for extracting features, for doing all the kinds of mapping and survey activities. This data set includes the full 3D uh, voxel map and the 4D elements as well, plus the LiDAR point cloud information, the high resolution imagery, the road networks by the functional classes, and obviously the vectorization. So all of the data automatically, we're not just collecting it and leaving it in raw data format as well, we're also doing all of the vectorization, all of the, the attributes, all of the feature extraction as well. So if you're just interested in certain features, we can extract uh, those. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like, this project is already uh, underway. So this is out of uh, the Bay Area, some of the, the data collection. This is looks like it's an aerial view, but this is obviously ground-based collection. So you can see very clearly the roads, the infrastructure. Um, and as I mentioned, this is all pre-segmented, pre-vectorized as well. So you can pull back again, all these different colors is the AI doing the automated recognition. Another example of this where we've got a lot of wires, for example, utility infrastructure here. Again, this is all being captured to high resolution and automatically extracted as well. So again, it's a very useful data set uh, that will be available for, for people and customers to use. With that, I'd like to hand back to Brian uh, to talk through some of these real world use cases. Thanks, Peter. All right, so what I'd like to do is talk a bit about uh, real world applications and use cases. And um, really there's a, a really broad capability on and across industry sector use cases that we can support. And so um, this is, this kind of gives you an idea of, you know, the areas. So it's, it's, like I said, it's pretty broad. It's, you know, GIS and asset inventory. It's, you know, roadway monitoring. It's identification of curbs and gutters or ADA compliance on, uh, on curbs or, you know, public works or virtual design. So it's a, a pretty broad base of, uh, of what we can do and, and where we have uh, supported customers. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. Um, this is a, a use case of mapping of traffic signs. So within the, uh, within the uh, road network right away, uh, we were contracted to drive an area uh, and do a uh, feature extraction of the signage inventory, basically do a signage inventory uh, within that right away for a major navigation company. And so across that uh, network that we drove, we identified and mapped out for them over 7 million signs. So a pretty significant amount of effort to, uh, to do that. We did the automated sign recognition and then all that data was then converted to uh, XML for delivery to them. Uh, installation compliance is another area. So this was for a local government. So we drove a number of the streets within a, uh, a local government. What we, that we had an existing database and so we could do change detection on existing assets to see where um, you know, compliance was, was in compliance or, or the installation was actually in compliance. Uh, based on uh, the contractor do doing that installation. Um, you know, we could do that. We did the automated feature recognition, uh, automated measurements of the assets as well. And then again, identification of the areas where there was uh, not compliance. Another area, uh, and especially and probably near and dear to the hearts of many people sitting on this call is a road network mapping. So, uh, we did a significant project for road network mapping for a major automotive company. Uh, in this case, we did a creation of HD maps for autonomous vehicle um, and feeding that data into the vehicle. Uh, we created the road lane models. We identified traffic signs, uh, extracted striping, and a number of other a number of other features. In terms of city infrastructure, so this was a uh, uh, a project that we did where we actually did automated asset mapping, so extraction, but we also utilized other content that the customer had. So we, uh, we took the data 
the street level mobile uh, mobile collected data and merged it with some uh, 3D models that they had uh, previously acquired as well in terms of the build the high rise buildings in that upper right. And so from that we were able to create this you know, digital twin of the city and then went through and did the automated feature extraction of of a, of a number of of assets being the roads you know uh, road furniture on the right of way utility assets in the right of way vegetation things such as that so pretty broad base so this just um, again you know some of this data was collected by us some collected by the customer really um, in our case we're really data source agnostic in terms of using the uh, voxel maps uh, technology the 4d uh, volumetric technology and the VAM software system as well uh, there's also a lot of capability in the area of airport and railway infrastructure. So, you know, on the railway side, it, we can do quickly perform measurements of the track and the uh, topographical and surrounding areas of a railway path, identify uh, vegetation encroachment as well, especially on uh, uh, electrified uh, rail lines and uh, identify any issues that may be happening after a, uh, after a major storm where you want to basically drive the, uh, the network and see where you may have washouts that cause, could cause problem to the integrity of the network. Um, on airports, uh, you know, LIDAR is being used today to capture features in the airport. So a number of features, you know, buildings, hangars, other objects, and again, both external and internal digital twins of all the facilities. As Peter mentioned before, being able to like maybe drive the external features and then import the data of the internal into that model is a much easier task uh, using the voxel technology. Uh, transportation accident studies. So, you know, ground-based LIDAR can be used to capture the uh, accident and crime scene, uh, can be used to quickly record the scene instead of using uh, traditional survey methods, we're seeing people use that today. Um, and this kind of allows, you know, come in quickly, scan the area, create the, and get out of there to get the traffic flowing, excuse me, get the traffic flowing smoothly, especially in um, areas where there's been a loss of life, because those tend to take a lot more time uh, for accident scene recreation. Um, some of the current challenges and future trends within this as well. So, uh, you know, we, we believe and know that mobile LIDAR is a, ha, has a huge potential for road inventory, um, primarily due to its uh, improved safety. So it's somebody in a vehicle driving, not somebody out on the road, you know, uh, with, a, uh, with a camera or a, uh, you know, a handheld LIDAR or, or a terrestrial LIDAR. It's already very flexible and the data reusability as well. So what we have found is our customers in the transportation space you know, we do the collection, they may be only interested in the roadway, but, you know, in six months, they may be interested in, uh, you know, some development in an area and they need to know, you know, what's in the right of way, you know, sitting out a couple hundred feet. And so the data is there for them to, uh, to use for, for further processing, further analysis down the road. Uh, it's an, act, you know, LIDAR is an active remote sensing technology and it really provides highly accurate 4D models uh, with high point density. So again, being able to go back and do collections using that forward, fourth dimension of time and being able to identify areas of change uh, within the transportation infrastructure. And then, you know, what we see in the future is that, you know, the whole mobility, the area of mobility, and you know, whether it's us walking or driving in vehicles, is probably the area where I see one of the biggest impacts of LIDAR uh, in terms of having autonomous vehicles continually being monitored and continually collecting data and providing that to sources that are doing, you know, real-time assessment of the, uh, of the road network, the roadway characteristics, the surface terrain, assets within the right-of-way, et cetera. So we, we continue to see this to be a, uh, a pretty significant growth area for anybody within the transportation space. In the urban area as well, so urban planning and digital twins. So, you know, digital twins is a is a, a very popular term today, but it's you know it's incredibly useful in having a uh, a digital twin of every feature, and that's really the focus of 
fossil maps is to create this digital twin of the planet. You know, that's why we're involved in uh, activities such as the Earth Archive, you know, that's going out and doing data collection in areas that, uh, that are only accessible via uh, airborne liner. Uh, but within the urban planning, so, you know, disaster management response and recovery. So post event, if you already have a digital twin of an area, you can quickly determine how much damage was done uh, post event uh, via mobile LIDAR or airborne, right? Um, construction monitoring, which is a really uh, popular area, you know, monitoring where uh, activities happening either along a roadway or other infrastructure like bridges, et cetera. Um, updating city base maps or, you know, historic preservation is one of the areas that's really popular. You know, that's why, you know, uh, the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, it was a really good thing. They had created a uh, 3D model of that in a digital twin so that after it burnt, uh, was extensively burned, they were able to go back and, and recreate that and, and, and create the models to, to rebuild to its uh, original historic levels. Um, in the smart city world, there's a lot of areas that, uh, you know, in the transportation departments at the local level can be involved in and use the voxel maps technology. So in terms of traffic monitoring, what you're seeing is, you know, you can monitor, well, the good thing about LIDAR is it, it works both day and night. So you can monitor traffic both day and night. Um, the vehicles themselves that have uh, uh, voxel tech, not voxel, but LIDAR technology can do uh, automated collection. They can identify vehicle types and it really helps uh, cities, smart cities gain a, a better understanding of where their traffic issues exist and why. And then on the area of security management as well. So, you know, being able to identify and tracking uh, people and assets and vehicles. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can fine tune the LIDAR for uh, alarm perimeters as well. And, you uh, help meet the needs or, you know, on private or, or the, the public assets, assets in the building structures themselves. We've also seen uh, a lot of our customers in the area of uh, having us create maps, doing the collection and creating maps for autonomous vehicles. So uh, in this case, you know, driving a, uh, uh, a you know, a limited access highway, uh, being able to collect not only the roadway and the right of way, but extracting, you know, uh, striping, uh, any feature, you know, within there, all the road furniture, uh, you know, guardrails, signage, and then performing automated measurements on all those features as well. So not only identifying them, but then it, uh, identifying the measurements of those and then extracting them and putting them into a, uh, a vectorized format for use in other systems. So um, our customers find that incredibly valuable. Another area in autonomous vehicles, you know, um, what we're seeing is that the vehicles themselves are becoming collection networks as part of this whole IoT infrastructure. And, and uh, they could replace some area collections. They provide a, a lot of very detailed content. And then this whole concept um, that Voxel Maps is promoting called the Constant Collection Network, where you have uh, LiDAR and cameras on uh, on vehicles like service vehicle fleets that are continually collecting data and providing that to a, uh, a central source for processing and uh, and updating of a, of a collective basement. Right? Um, and also the you know the the whole with the whole smart cities concept is this whole vehicle to everything. So vehicles will be connected you know to a number of different devices and applications as they're driving uh, to support things like smart parking, right? So, uh, you know, the, the V2X vehicle, everything in LiDAR could identify open spots uh, for parking. I read an article last week that said there's four parking spots for every vehicle in the United States. And I don't know about you, but every time I go to, uh, you know, a shopping area, you know, a lot of them are tough to find places, a place to park. And this could to help in that manner. Also, um, an area that I'm seeing a lot of interest is in performing geometric assessments of the roadway. So, um, 
you know, using uh, collecting data and then doing highway attribution, such as uh, site distance, you know, stopping site distance. So, you know, you've got groups that can consume LIDAR and have applications to do that, like RDV systems, um, that, you know, as you drive a roadway, it identifies areas where you have limited site distance, so you need to slow down, right? Um, and I really feel that that, you know, as people continue in the transportation sector continue to use LIDAR, that there's gonna be this paradigm shift in actually using that geometric assessment and safety audits uh, and how they're used uh, by uh, DOTs and local uh, transportation organizations. And, you know, despite this whole huge potential, there's been limited research in that particular area. So I don't know if any of you were involved in the uh, geometric design, but uh, that's an area where, uh, you know, there could be significant uh, opportunities for growth. So this is showing a example use of our, uh, our voxel maps uh, indoor visual uh, positioning system. So um, I will start this and I think Peter is going to describe what's going on in this video. Yeah, actually, just before you, you started, Brian, let me just explain what we're seeing here. So th this use case is around automating miniature robots using an indoor voxel map to position uh, themselves. So what we see in, in the bottom screen is the voxel map. So we went inside and we first built the voxel map of the, the interior space of this office. And then the two top screens are actually the cameras from the robot. So the one on the left is the RGB values. It's what we're used to seeing. So as the robot is moved through the scene, and what you can see on the right is the depth camera doing all of the recognition. So what's happening here is it's recognizing pre-mapped voxels so that the, the AMR, the automated miniature robot, has a copy of the voxel map internally and can compare the, the voxels around it to triangulate its position. So it can do this in completely GPS denied environments uh, with centimeter level pre uh, precision, not just in terms of the X and Y axis, but the Z axis as well. You'll see this as they're going up the stairs. So it's a really uh, powerful technology actually for enabling automation and robotics inside. And this whole model is exactly the same. It's the, you know, the same model that we're using for mapping the outside of buildings and cities uh, you know, in the country. The same technology is being used inside to create this interior map as well. All right. Thank you, Peter. No problem. It gives you an idea of what can be done internal to, uh, to, uh, to buildings, et cetera. So back to the outdoor. So in terms of uh, utility assets, so many times utility assets are in the right of way of the transportation quarters. Sometimes they're not, but many times they are. So um, this is a project for that we performed uh, doing uh, utility infrastructure asset capture, uh, actually using aerial LIDAR. So uh, we uh, uh, partnered with an organization that collected the data, and then we did the data processing of all this content, and then used the VAM software to do all the uh, AI ML based automated feature extraction. So we did some additional training of the algorithms on uh, these particular uh, transmission assets and then uh, validated that and then did the uh, feature extraction. Another area is, is like vegetation encroachment. So, you know, this one here is for a utility, but it could also be in the transportation sector where, you know, the vegetation is growing, um, you know, out and over a road. But in this case, um, we, we did the data collection. Uh, as you can see, the top image is the image, the RGB image of uh, from the, uh, the symbol system. The middle image is the RGB values attached to the voxels that we collected, the LIDAR. And then the bottom one shows vegetation encroachment. So different distance, different colors are different distances from conductor lines. So you can actually identify, uh, you know, the amount of vegetation around a conductor line, create that vegetation quantification, generate a report of those particular boxes and the location of those, and uh, and use that for vegetation management, like work order monitor and their work order management systems as well. Uh, change detection, you know, change detection is a, a pretty common theme, and so 
in this case, uh, we had uh, we had collected the area in uh, in San Francisco. So we had the base map already collected and the customer was interested in identification of new 5G antenna assets on poles. So uh, we did the uh, post installation collect and then use the AI and ML based automated feature extraction to extract those antennas. And this helped uh, that particular customer in the validation of contract and work orders. Okay, so pretty valuable to them. And, and really all they wanted was identification of where that asset was, what the asset looked like, um, you know, and the, the geographic location on, the, on that particular poll. Make sure that it was put on this poll, not on this poll. Right? And then we've done some work as well in the 5G signal mapping and attenuation. So in this case, you know, we uh, drove a city and uh, within that city, this particular customer within the uh, telco space had uh, 5G asset antennas. And so from those, we could uh, had generated signal attenuation models and then voxelize that in 3D space. And so then, uh, you know, the top image is an aerial view of the data we collected. The middle one is basically driving the street and those individual voxels in the air there are, you know, uh, 5G signal uh, propagation models. Uh, and what we've done as well is we also collected data internal to their uh, uh, structures, their own buildings that they own. And then you can do the same thing there. You can actually walk the building or look at maps of the building internally of where there is 5G signal strength or where there's dead zones. And so that helps them in, uh, in uh, identification of areas where they need additional infrastructure to support them. This was a, uh, a recent POC group concept that we did with uh, a, a uh, telco. And so if you think about uh, the process to actually create uh, maps for vehicles, right? So we did a road data collection of, a, of an area of a city. And so the data collection and harvesting, we used the, our HD mobile mapping symbol system that Peter talked about earlier. We then provided the, uh, the physical hard drives were then shipped to a, you know, a data center. Data center can process those, do all the, the corrections, data alignment, uh, you know, if you require PPK corrections, et cetera, et cetera, the merging of the voxel data, and then doing a feature extraction and the vectorization of that, and then creating that HD map. Um, you know, that whole process takes about one to two weeks. And then that's provided to the contractors who then uh, provide that data to the vehicles out on the street. And that, you know, that whole process is about a five to six week process. So it's a pretty, you know, it's, it's short in the whole scheme of things, that's pretty short, but for certain applications, that's too long. So what we did was we, uh, we teamed up with Verizon and AWS and uh, we have the exact same collection, except at this time we have a, a Wi-Fi. Uh, device on the uh, on the symbol system. So the data is collected. We're passing the LIDAR data to uh, via the 5G network, via the 5G edge network from Verizon. And that is then uh, delivered over the 5G network to the Verizon center, uh, their facility, which has a an AWS wavelength instance, which is basically, a, you know, an AWS uh, Mac app at, at Verizon, so it does the processing right there with incredibly low latency. We then create the, the 3D model, do the extraction, build the HD map, and deliver it to the vehicle, back to the vehicle on the road. Um, and the turnaround time from the collection to the vehicle having a full 3D model was 15 seconds. So pretty uh, average 15 seconds, I should say but a pretty incredible time reduction. And, uh, you know, no doubt both AWS and Verizon were incredibly happy with this. And Peter was part of a presentation at the uh, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona last month, uh, describing this, this uh, proof of concept and application. So what I wanted to do was talk a little bit because there's, there's a lot of money available or to be available, 
uh, in this U.S. Senate infrastructure bill, specifically for for road infrastructure. Um, so I just thought I'll share with you a little bit, but uh, we're putting together a white paper that we'd love to share with you uh, that kind of digs into it. So it's not, you know, it's not uh, tied specifically to voxel maps. We just, you know, we'd like to help educate people in terms of the opportunity that exists uh, within this. So this uh, House Bill 3684, it authorizes funds for federal aid, highways, highway safety programs, and transit programs, and for, you know, a lot of other purposes, as we well know. But uh, in reading that full text, um, you can go ahead and read the 2,700 pages uh, if you'd like. But, you know, what we've done is we're pulling together a white paper that pulls out the, the key components for those of us involved in the geospatial realm. But there is significant emphasis in this bill on geospatial modernization and innovation. So this just, you know, it's a, it's a 1.2 trillion over eight years. It's a lot of money to spend. But, you know, um, if you look at these, People on this call that are interested in transportation, this is us, right? Uh, a lot of it is, is, is what we do within the transportation sector. So um, lots of opportunity out there. Um, and we'll kind of dig into some of these numbers in the, in the white paper and provide that to you as well. So an interesting thing is that, <clears throat> excuse me, when you read through the bill, you know, the terms digital twin, digital cities, virtual reality, augmented reality, they're not highlighted in the bill, but I think they're probably, you know, they're too specific to mention in the bill, but they represent a, a really solid pathway to fulfilling the goals that the bill uh, otherwise outlines so well, right? So there's opportunity, they don't talk about digital twins, but, you know, the underlying technology I see is this, you know, the whole voxel technology, basically. And, you know, one of the areas uh, is, you know, the digitalization of construction. And that's going to be, you know, that has to be very rich in the 3D environments for design and construction and that whole infrastructure life cycle. So uh, I really, uh, I, we really feel that the bill may be a catalyst for many organizations to finally take that full 3D and 4D plunge, right, into using, into using the technology in a, in a pretty wide, a wide way. All right, so uh, Peter gave us an overview of uh, Voxel Maps as an organization and the significant history of the organization that we have in, in uh, performing LIDAR and, uh, and uh, visual mapping. Uh, he then talked about the concept of maps for machines and uh, a bit about volumetric mapping 101 and you know and the way that we do it, what we see in terms of volumetric mapping in this whole 4D volumetric space. Uh, talked a bit about the symbol uh, and our data collection and how we go about that. And then the 100 cities, uh, the DAS data set that we've just recently embarked on in terms of collecting data across one of the, across the 100 largest metros in the U.S. Um, I provide an overview of some of the use cases, potential use cases across the transportation segment, as well as a number of other industries. And then uh, a, a brief overview of the Senate infrastructure bill that uh, Everybody on this call should be interested in, like I said, we'll be putting out a white paper in the near term that will definitely get in your hands. And I think you'll find it very valuable. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. And I'll just say if, if, if anybody has any specific questions that they have that they, you know, don't feel comfortable in sharing with the group or asking to the group, you can reach out to uh, to Peter and I and our, our contact information right there. But um, Let me look. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Is it possible to find the weight and volume of vegetation with this technology? So I would say the, I don't, yeah, the weight, probably not. The volume of vegetation, yes, because we're, uh, we're measuring, each voxel has a measurement structure and has a, a coordinate to it. And so in those, in that, in that volumetric model that I was showing, in terms of the vegetation encroachment, um, you can you can run a report uh, and, and export a CSV showing all the voxels within those certain segments or distances. Um, uh, question says your slides have the noise removed, especially those involving transportation. Are you going to have slides showing your process to remove that noise? I, I can't. 
Okay. Yeah, so, so it's a really good question, actually. So there's two aspects of, of noise. Um, there's obviously noise just generated by the LIDARs themselves. Um, and there's noise, you know, when you're trying to merge multiple passes of data together, multiple point clouds, and obviously convert into voxels. That uh, approach, uh, that's all done in our processing pipeline. Um, we use a lot of advanced SLAM technologies to do that. So simultaneous lo localization and mapping uh, for doing it. But in particular, when you talk about noise from things like cars or people or traffic that we don't want, we use deep neural networks to do that. So we actually identify cars using AI and we extract those from the data set. So you'll notice there were no cars, people, pedestrians, cyclists, pets, et cetera. That's all done uh, thanks to the AI and the deep learning. Thanks. So here's, here's another question that says, our, um, our DOT service area is quite large. What's the largest area you have been contracted to collect? So uh, last year, uh, Voxel Maps collected over 650,000 miles of roadways uh, across Canada and the continental US. So a pretty significant amount. That's um, you know, 650,000 miles is about 50 times around the Earth at the equator. So uh, a lot of driving, a lot of, a lot of windshield time. Uh, quite, here's another question. Um, if using data from multiple sources collected via different vendors, what sorts of challenges do you encounter calibrating those at scale so that you get them to align with, uh, with our universal references? Yeah, no, again, a really good question. So, so we're used to ingesting data from many different sources as well. Clearly we have our own sensors and they're all pre-calibrated and they, they work you know, seamlessly with our model. But at the same time, we can adjust from other mobile mapping solutions, other fixed solutions, or you know, pedestrian mapping, you know, where you have backpack solutions, and also aerial lidar as well. So, you know, we've done a number of scans a few weeks ago. We just finished scanning San Francisco uh, from from the air using a helicopter and aerial lidar as well. So, there are a number of um, parameters which we need to do calibration. And um, so, generally speaking, when we're working with somebody else we'll go through that. It's, it's really just an understanding so we can make sure that we correct for those, those things when we import. So there's a little bit of manual work in the beginning um, just to make sure the calibration works. Um, and once that's set, then the ingestion happens uh, pretty seamlessly. Okay. And then here's another question. How are you going forward with processing in areas that do not have 5G connections, such as in rural or national park areas? And I, I would I would answer that in saying that we don't you know to do the collection and processing we it's not required to have a 5G connection so that 5G uh, connection that we had for that POC that proof of concept was for a particular area with heavy uh, 5G coverage. Yeah, so so just adding to that, so each of the symbols um, have SSD drives in them as well, so everything is stored on the SSD uh, SSD drives. And um, typically, you know, in the old uh, way of uh, processing, we would just take those drives out and, you know, plug them into our data center and essential or ship them to the data center. Um, and that would be the, the most efficient way. If there is a 5G connection, obviously we can offload with 5G, but clearly in a national park area, that's not going to be likely. So it would be the, the standard approach of writing to the hard drives and swapping the hard drives out. Okay. And you somewhat answered this before, but um, I like the high definition maps you create with your symbol system. However, I also need to collect top-down views of some of my assets. How do you? How can you collect both? And and you know that's really no problem because we have uh, strategic relationships with both uh, manned aerial and UAS ba based data collection organizations. So we can you know as Peter mentioned earlier, we consume a wide variety of rich sensor content and from various platforms and use that within the BAM software platform. So, um, you know, we could be the single source and and uh, do the driving, the mobile collection, as well as contract with organizations to help us with the aerial. As Peter mentioned, we just actually just completed the San Francisco area, both driving and with a, uh, with a rotorcraft with helicopter. Another good question. So, um, how much processing are you doing on the edge? Just the initial LIDAR, uh, running ML models and calibrating to your system, all the way to extraction and deliverable. So you want to yeah. address that? 
Sure, sure, no problem. Again, good question. So on the edge, the, the primary thing that the, the, the system is doing there is what we call the sensor fusion. So it's taking all of the information uh, from the LiDAR, from the cameras, from the IMU, GPS, et cetera, and fusing that into what we call a voxel stream. And then it's that stream which is then either sent uh, directly to our private uh, cloud um, or you know, shipped essentially in the, in the hard drives. It is doing some calibration. It is doing a little bit of SLAM as well um, at that stage, but the bulk of the ML and the extraction happens in post-processing within our cloud. All right. And then there was a question early on uh, about the presentations and the person liked the presentations. Do you offer documentation for PDHs? So um, currently we do not, Charles. Okay. And then the last question that I see here is about pricing. It says, how do you price your content? So um, pricing is pretty uh, broad in terms of how we can how we can price. So it's really based on customer requirements. So do you need it via DAS or an FTP? Um, do you want full ownership or you just want to license the data for, you know, your extraction purposes? And then um, we can do it uh, many times is by linear mile in terms of the collection, um, but also we can do it by the the number of assets that we extract. So, you know, if you're if you're just looking at, I just want the roadway, you know, by linear mile, we can certainly price it there. So we're pretty open to, to pricing the product really um, any way you, you want. Uh, what countries are you operating in? So uh, I mentioned before that we've done, uh, we did collections last year in the US and Canada. Uh, so far this year, I know we've been in Australia, we did Singapore, Hong Kong, um, I think Slovenia. Peter, are any other countries that we've collected in already this year or in the, in the near past? Yeah, so I mean, so Voxel specifically, we're, we're um, active in about 26 countries now. Um, so, I mean, the biggest ones are still North America, um, but as, as you say, across Europe, uh, into Asia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, um, a little bit in Latin America as well. Okay, cool. Well, we're coming up on the hour and there's no further questions. So um, we really appreciate, Peter, and I appreciate you taking the time today to uh, listen to our presentation and, and uh, hopefully we've we sparked some interest in terms of what we could do together. Uh, we'd love to talk to you further about some of the projects you're working on and how we can support some of those applications. And as I mentioned, we'll be reaching out to you as well uh, with this white paper on the uh, infrastructure bill. And, and hopefully that'll spark some interest in how we can help you in that capacity as well. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, Bye-bye.